Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Lecture 14 is a direct continuation of lecture 13, for which last time we were solving systems of linear equations by reducing the associated augmented matrix via the, uh, some type of combination of three elementary row operations. And we would use these operations to transform the augmented matrix into an equivalent matrix, which was in echelon form. Uh, when the matrix was in echelon form, it was a whole lot easier to solve, perhaps using the methods of back substitution. And in this lecture 14, we want to continue do that, doing that, but instead of being so mysterious about it like we were in lecture 13, we want to be very precise about how we make the decisions we do and thus presenting the so-called Gauss-Jordan elimination um, algorithm here. Uh, related to this is known as the Gauss elimination technique, uh, sometimes called Gaussian elimination. Um, some people use those two terms interchangeably, Gaussian elimination versus Gauss-Jordan elimination. Uh, for the purpose of this class, I'm not going to enforce a strict adherence to uh, one term or the other. There is a slight difference in technique, and I'll point it out when we get there, uh, but honestly, whichever approach you would take isn't going to make much of a difference for you as you work with this method to solve systems of linear equations. So let's talk about the Gauss-Jordan elimination technique. Uh, so the idea is that we use this technique to solve systems of linear equations, and we first do that by translating a augmented matrix, excuse me, we first start by translating a linear system into an augmented matrix like we did in the previous lesson. So for the sake of example, consider the following uh, augmented matrix. So we'll have entries three, uh, 0, 3, negative 6, augment with 18. That's the first row. The second row will be 3, negative 7, 16, uh, negative 5. And then lastly, we have 3, negative 9, 12, and negative 9. So this is just an example matrix. Uh, and associated to this would be a system of linear equations. The first equation would be 3y minus 6z is equal to 18. The second equation would be 3x minus 7y plus 16z is equal to negative 5. And then the last equation would be 3x minus 9y plus 12z is equal to negative 9. Remember, each of the columns inside the matrix, inside the coefficient side of the matrix, is associated to a variable. The right side, this augmented column, is associated to the right-hand side of those equations. And this vertical line is exactly where the equal signs would be. So we've just encoded the linear system as a matrix. So this is what we learned about in lesson uh, 13. And we're going to utilize this to help us uh, to solve linear systems much more efficiently. So the first step of Gaussian elimination is once you have your augmented matrix here, you're going to begin with the leftmost non-zero column. This is what's going to become the current pivot column. Um, and the pivot column will be at the very top of this, of this column. All right, so when you look at this matrix right here, you don't see any zero columns. A zero column would be like, Zero, zero, zero. It has only zeros inside of it, okay? Since we don't have anything like that, um, the left column is the leftmost non-zero column. That's typically going to be the case. So this right here is what we refer to as our pivot column. And it gets the name pivot uh, because the, the rest of the calculations, the row operations we're going to do in, in short order here, is going to be pivoting around the pivot position we're now going to introduce into side of the matrix. Now, given our pivot column, we're going to put the pivot position in the topmost spot that we can do. Right now, that's the very top of the column. But as we start to uh, move to the right in our matrix, your next pivot position can't be higher than the previous pivot position because we're trying to put a matrix in echelon form. So you take the topmost spot that the pivot position can be in for the very first column that's non-zero that's going to be the very top. Now it's okay that there's a zero in that position. You just can't have, you, you don't have a pivot in a zero column, but the pivot position could have a zero inside of it. That's okay. Um, that actually leads to the second step in Gaussian elimination here. So the second step is that you're going to select a non-zero entry in the pivot column and you're going to move it into the pivot position and you will want to use your interchange operation to do that. 
Okay, so looking at our matrix here, there is in fact a zero in the pivot column. We don't, uh, in the pivot position, excuse me. We don't want a zero in the pivot position. Ideally, we would love a one, but honestly, any non-zero number will work for us. So we have to put something non-zero in the pivot position, and we can do that by interchange. And how we do that exactly, it doesn't really matter. As long as you grab some non-zero entry, and put it in the pivot position. Because it's a non-zero column, there is at least some number in that column that's non-zero, make that interchange. And it doesn't really matter which one you do. Um, for the sake of this example, I'm gonna interchange the first and third rows. So interchanging row one and three, which I will typically denote using this arrow here, just connecting the rows that we're swapping here. And so if we interchange those rows, we'll get something like the following. The third row now becomes the first row. Three minus nine, sorry, three, negative nine, 12, negative nine again. Uh, then the second row, we didn't do anything to it. So three, negative seven, 16, negative five. And then the first row is down at the bottom, zero, three, negative six, 18. So we interchange the two rows, but be aware that the pivot position is still one, one the top left position there. Uh, the pivot position didn't move, um, but everything moves around the pivot position as we were explaining just a moment ago, okay? Now, with your pivot position, it's really nice um, if you have a one in the pivot position there. Uh, like, so that's what I was just saying earlier. Now, it's not necessary to have a one, but it's super, super nice. Um, the proper Gauss-Jordan elimination technique um, would actually postpone this step until later. But if we can get a one in here, that's really, really nice. Why might you postpone it? Well, there's a lot of possible reasons. Like if you took, like for example, if we had interchanged rows one and two, so what if we put this row actually in the first spot? In order to get a one in the pivot position, you have to scale the entire row by three, uh, which it does perfectly great right here. You get a one, but here you would get a negative seven thirds. Here you get a 16 thirds. Here you're gonna get a negative five thirds. Fractions are a nightmare to most college algebra students. And so dividing by three just to get a one isn't necessarily the, the best thing to do. We can actually talk about that in a later video in this lecture here. We'll stick with this one for now. The reason I actually grabbed the third row as opposed to the second row is I noticed that in the third row, which was originally the third row, it's now the first row, everyone in the first row is divisible by three. So if I were to divide row one by three, I could get a one in my pivot position, which is extremely ideal, uh, but I also don't get any fractions because everyone was divisible by three. So if we divide the first row by three, we get one, negative three, four, and negative three. Now again, getting the entire row divisible by a factor is not always the simplest thing. Sometimes you have to accept fractions. The good news is that you can usually procrastinate fractions. So that's another thing, uh, you know, we don't like fractions. Sometimes we like to procrastinate, uh, in which case, in this situation, we do both, and it makes us all happy. That's perfectly great. So we now get a one in this position. That's ideal. Not necessary. Um, step three is sort of like an optional step when it comes to Gaussian elimination. If you don't do it now, you can do it later. Uh, many of us like to do it now, but not, certainly not at the price of introducing fractions into this thing. Okay? So then we look at step four. Once we have our non-zero entry in a pivot position, ideally a one, um, we can start using row replacement to zero out all of the zeros above or below the pivot position, right? So with this matrix, there is a three below the pivot position. We want to get rid of that. This one's already a zero, so we don't have to do anything with it. Um, the nice thing about having a one in this pivot position is that in order to get rid of this number, you're just going to look at that number and pick its additive inverse. That is, in order to get rid of the three, we're going to replace row two with row two minus three times row one. Okay, now if this number is not a one, um, you're gonna have to probably use fractions to make this thing work. So again, this is the procrastination of the fractions here. Um, if, if, we, if we can, we like to avoid the fractions as much as possible. Having a one in your pivot position is super nice in that regard. Okay, so in that, the next step, now we're gonna do replacement. We've, we've done interchange, we've done scaling, now we're gonna do replacement. So we're gonna take row one and times everything by negative three. For convenience, I like to take this entire row, we times everything by negative three, and I'm gonna write a little superscript up here. So for the first column, one times negative three is negative three. For the next one, negative three times negative three is positive nine. The next one, four times negative three is negative 12. And then for the last one, negative three times three is again a positive nine like so. 
And so then I just write these little superscripts because I don't want to do too much in my head. The more I do in my head, um, the more difficult this can get. But at the same time, I don't want to write endlessly uh, lines of matrices right here. So these little superscripts have been a useful tool to help us uh, do our math with fewer mistakes. I'm not changing anything in the first row. So we're going to get one, negative three, four, and negative three. Um, nothing in the third row changed either. Zero, three, negative six, and 18 there. Um, it's the second row that changes. Again, I'm going to add these superscripts here. 3 minus 3 is 0. I get a 0 below the 1, which is what I was looking for. Negative 7 plus 9 is a positive 2. 16 minus 12 is a positive 4. And then 9 minus 5 is a positive 4 as well. And so at this point, uh, let's see. We use row replacement to create zeros in all of the positions above and below the pivot. In the first situation, you didn't have a pivot. Uh, you didn't have anything above the pivot. So we just did everything below. And so next, what we're going to do is we're going to focus our attention because with this pivot column, we've now finished it. We have a one in the pivot position. We have zeros everywhere else. That's exactly what we want to do. Next, we're going to switch our attention to this sub matrix. Um, looking at the sub matrix here, where is the first? We're going to start repeating. We're going to start repeating uh, the operations here. So we now look at this sub matrix and we identify. So let's read step five here. I didn't do that yet. Consider the sub matrix by ignoring any rows or columns containing a previously used pivot position. So we're going to remove this row, remove this column. So we get a sub matrix. So then we're going to start step one again, which remember, because you can't see it on the screen right now, with step one, we're going to look for the leftmost non-zero column, which is going to be this one right here. Um, and then we're going to put a pivot in the very top. Now, it's important you look at the sub matrix because um, even though that this number here is non-zero, I only care about these right here. If both of those numbers were zero, we'd actually have to move over to the next column to look for the leftmost non-zero column, even if this one is non-zero. Um, it's only in the sub matrix. The rows and columns that contain pivots we're ignoring as we go through this algorithm. So this is going to be our new pivot position. So let's put it right here. And then we, we're, we're going to repeat steps two through five. That is, we repeat this whole process until we finish. So I'm going to move to another screen so I have a little bit more space to work this thing out here. Um, if I copy down the matrix we had just a moment ago, because it's now gone, the first column was now reduced, row reduced. So we had the one, zero, zero. The next row currently looks like, excuse me, the next column currently looks like negative three, two, and three. Uh, then four, four negative six, and then negative three, four, and 18, like so, okay? Our pivot position now is gonna move to the two, two spot. And some people like to write all the pivot pivot positions that we've used so far, like I might keep a box in the one, one spot. Now I'm focusing on the two, two spot, and I want to start row reducing the matrix there. All right, so I have a two in the pivot position. I would love it if there was a one. A quick examination, it's like, oh, wow, everything in the second row is divisible by two. So I could actually divide by two and then row reduce the matrix in that way. Um, oftentimes, as you see these problems, we're going to connect matrices together with this little twiddle symbol here. Um, the idea is these matrices are not equal to each other because as you change the numbers, that changes the matrix. And a matrix is only equal if all of the numbers inside of the matrix are equal to each other, but it is row equivalent, as in we do row operations to change the matrix, and that's how they're the same. They're not equal matrices, they're row equivalent matrices, or just equivalent matrices for short. And so thus we don't use an equal sign, we use a little twiddle um, to suggest the equivalence there. So this gives me a one in the pivot position. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm now going to use row replacement. I didn't have to interchange anything this time because I had a non-zero entry in my pivot and I actually like that one because I could get a one there very nicely. So next what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the zeros above and below the pivot. So I want to get rid of this negative three right here. Um, so I'm going to take row one plus three times row two. So what this means is I'm going to take one times three. It goes right here. Two times three gives me a six and then two times three gives me another six. If I add those together, it's going to get rid of the negative three, but I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I also want to get rid of this three right here. And to do that, I'm going to take row three and replace it with row three minus three times row two. So this gives me a three, uh, sorry, a minus three, a minus six, and a minus six. All right. Uh, feel free to use lots of paper here because these matrices can get big. 
but this, I promise you, is a very efficient way to write these things down. So um, I kind of can't see that matrix there. Let's do try this again. So I didn't do anything to the first pivot column. You never, that's never going to change for the rest of the problem. Next, we're going to get negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. 4 plus 6, which is 10. And then the augmented column there. 6 minus 3 is equal to 3. The second row doesn't change this time. 0, 1, 2, and 2. And then for the third row, we have the 0. Um, then we're going to have 3 minus 3, which is 0. And then we're going to get negative 6 minus 6. Be careful on that one. It's not 0. That's a negative 12. And then you're going to get 18 minus 6, which is 12 like so. So now if you look at the first column, it's completely row reduced. A 1 in the pivot position, 0 is everywhere else. Then you look at the second pivot column. There's a 1 in the pivot position, and there's zeros everywhere else. It's completely row reduced. So with that now done, we move to the next column over and look for a non-zero number in rows that don't already have pivots. So that means our next pivot position is going to be this one right here, 3, 3. And then we continue to row reduce this thing. I would love a 1 to be there. So if I would divide everything by negative 12, so take row 3 and divide everything by negative 12, Fortunately, again, there's no fractions here. I did choose this example so that in the end, uh, fractions were never needed because uh, I know many of us are deathly afraid of those fractions. Uh, so if you divide negative 12 by negative 12, you're going to get a 1. If you divide positive 12 by negative 12, you're going to get a negative 1, like so. And so again, we still have our pivots. In particular, it's this final pivot that we're interested in. But for the sake of illustration, I like to put all of the pivot boxes there. Now that we have a 1 in the pivot position, we got to get rid of all the zeros in the column other than that 1, which means we got to get rid of this 10 right here. We can do that by replacing row 1 with row 1 minus 10 times row 3. So we're going to get a negative 10 right here. We're going to get a positive 10 right there. Now for the second row, we want to get rid of this 2 right here. To accomplish that, we're going to replace row 2 with row 2 minus 2 times row 3. So we get 1 times negative 2, which is negative 2. We take negative 1 times negative 2, that gives us a positive 2. And then we're going to add these things together. And our matrix to then be row reduced at that moment. So looking at the first row, you're going to go 1, 0, 0, 10 minus 10 is 0. Then you get 3 plus 10, which is 13. Uh, then for the next row, you're going to get 0, 1, 0, because uh, again, 2 minus 2 is 0. Then you're going to get 2 plus 2, which is 4. And then lastly, you get 0, 0, 1, and then we didn't do anything to negative 1 that time. So looking at the coefficient matrix, we now have it row reduced. Uh, this matrix now is in row reduced echelon form. Uh, that is the coefficient matrix right here. And then once it's in row reduced echelon form, this right here should be, in fact, our solution. In fact, the, the solution to this equation, uh, to the system of linear equations, you have three variables, x, y, and z, for which x should equal 13, y should equal 4, and z should equal 1. That solves the, the, that solves the problem, the system of linear equations. We accomplish this using this method of Gauss-Jordan elimination. Um, so the idea of Gauss-Jordan elimination is that you use repeated uses of scaling, replacement, and interchange to row reduce the coefficient matrix until you obtain the row reduced echelon form. And once, this, once the coefficient matrix has been row reduced to its RREF, then the augmented column should bear the solution to this system of linear equations. Uh, we'll demonstrate how to do this in a few more examples, but this at least explains the Gaussian-Jordan elimination technique, how we can use it to row reduce matrices and solve systems of linear equations.